All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening for our January meeting of the La Mesa Foothills Democratic Club. I'm and here I thought I was doing everything right. All right, that's better. Got that little feedback thing switched off. Let's try this once again. Thank you for taking the time to join us for the January meeting of the La Mesa Foothills Democratic Club. It is Wednesday, January 6th, 2021, an eventful day today. Uh, I am Mitch Wagner. I am VP Communications for the club. Um, so I think one thing we've learned over the last 10 months, all of us, is that even when the world seems to be burning down and rebuilding itself better, perhaps, you just got to get on with things. You just got to live your life. Um, normal things have to continue happening. And that's what we're doing today. Um, we've all watched the news and we know what's going on. But I don't know if we're going to have much to say about that tonight, just because we're not there. We're here. Um, uh, it's important to continue living our lives and doing what we need to do and, and participating in democracy so that bad things like this don't happen again in the future. And that's what we're here to do today. Uh, we have finally achieved our decades-long dream of turning San Diego blue. Yay! What now, though? We've got two local leaders who will talk about priorities for the coming years through the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Our guests include Nathan Fletcher, who was recently selected as the chair of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors, and Raul Campillo, San Diego City Council Representative for District 7. That's a little bit of a different speaker lineup than when we expected. Uh, we had two last minute cancellations earlier today, including uh, Sarah Jacobs, our recently elected uh, US Congresswoman who quite understandably has other priorities today. We hope Ms. Jacobs, her staff and colleagues stay safe during these difficult times and we're grateful to them for their hard work protecting democracy. Um, in addition to hearing from Mr. Fletcher and Campillo, we've got board elections coming up with a couple of very special guests to help us through that. As always, we are streaming this live on our YouTube channel. So if you have friends or family who can't make it tonight on Zoom or you experience technical difficulties and have to leave us, you can watch that on the YouTube channel. Just search for La Mesa Foothills Democratic Club on YouTube. If you have anything you need to bring to our attention or you notice any technical problem or anybody disrupting the meeting, please message either of my two board colleagues, Evelyn Andrade and Katie Segetti, or message me. So let's begin. I'm gonna start by uh, inviting our club president, Tina Reinberg to speak. Take it, Tina, I'm gonna unmute you now. Hi everybody, thank you for being here. I, I won't be able to talk to you later because uh, we will be having the elections and I won't be able to participate in that because I'm also running to be your president again. Um, I was gonna say also, um, I said a few minutes ago, I, I lost some family members to COVID and I'm, I, it's strange man at the grocery store accosted me today. And I, he started to try and tell me that, you know, debunk theories. And I said, I'm not the good person to talk to about that today. I just lost two family members. And so he tried to get me to, to join some therapy group. And I'm like, you know what? I have a very large group of, of supportive friends and family that helped me. So thank you to all of you who wished me good wishes. I do have some uh, a message from Sarah. I sent her a message before I knew that she couldn't come, just saying, I hope you're okay. And she responded a few minutes ago. Uh, I was in the house chamber and had to evacuate. It was scary there for a moment, but I'm okay. Thank you for checking. So I'm sure it will be very interesting hearing her perspective on what happened today at a later meeting. Um, thank you all for being here and um, on with the meeting. Thank you, Tina. Um, so our next item of business is board elections, and I'm going to turn things over to uh, Dr. Carol Perkins, uh, who is going to oversee this process. All right, I'm unmuting Carol. And I'm also unmuting another person, her secret name on Zoom. Because she's been logged oh, in. Oh, I'm on Charles. I'm on Charles. There you are. 
There we go. Okay, because my computer lost its mic. Are, are we good? Yes, we're ready. We hear you loud okay, and clear. Right. And, and you look great too, by the way. So well, and, and <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for calling me, Dr. Carol. I would never in my entire teaching career have allowed my students to call me Dr. Perkins. I thought it was pretentious, but since this happened to Jill Biden, you can all call me Dr. Perkins with my PhD in education. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank you, Mitch. All right. What a day, okay? We need to elect our officers for the coming year. And before I read this list, if you have ever thought you might want to give some time and energy to what we are doing in this time, please raise your hand when I say, are there any nominations from the floor? Because we do have some unfilled positions that we would very much like to fill. So as we go forward, we do have this sixth day of January, Jan 2021, we, we propose and submit the following people for President Artina Reinberg, for Treasurer, we need somebody, Secretary, we need somebody, VP, Vice President for, for membership, thank you, Katie, Katie Segetti for the laws and legislation. Sean, I've never said your last name out loud, but I hope it's Kintal. <laughs> VP for political action, Chris Pearson. We need a VP for programming. Members at large, we have seven seats. We have running for those seven seats. Incumbents, Evelyn Andrade, Sharon Cox, Merrill Perry, and Mitch Wagner. We need also to add a new person to that, Cheryl Robertson. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, and then we have, um, that's it as far as named in incumbents and, and people running. So we would need to know that you might have a nomination from the floor and if you do, the chair will ask for a nomination All right, just as a matter of logistics, if you have a nomination, please raise your hand uh, with the Zoom thing, not with your actual physical hand, and uh, also, or or just type it into the chat, which would actually be better. That'd work. That'd be that'd be work great. Shall I look at the Ooh. chat too? Um, hold on, Linda, did, I just unmuted you. Did you uh, have something you wanted to say there? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I had added Steve Yashanka. Oh, I missed it. Steve, I lost you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Special events, Steve Yashanka. I am so sorry. That's okay. You just kind of gave me a heart attack, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Steve, sorry. Okay, we're good. So again, board members at large, communications, Mitch Wagner, special events, Steve Yashanka, uh, Evelyn Andrade, Sharon Cox, Tracy Magnuson, Meryl Perry and Cheryl Robertson. All right, once again, if you have uh, any other nominees, uh, please type your name in text. That's actually preferred because it's easier or use the raise hand function on Zoom. And remember, if you raise your physical hand, I can't see you. <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't see anybody. Carol, Carol are you good right, with that? All right, all right, my dears. Then let us say, I will ask you for a vote of, uh, to, from the entire body here to um, a vote of acclamation. Let's call for the vote. Everybody in favor of this slate of candidates, please, how do we do this? Indicate it, say aye. Raise, for, uh, raise, raise your hand in chat is, uh, using the Zoom thing is fine. Okay. Oh, we're good. I'm seeing it. All right. All right. And we should we should probably ask for nay votes too, maybe. Is there Is anyone? May I ask if there's anyone opposed to this slate of candidates? Please raise your hand. Whoa. All 
I think I think one or two of you who are running actually forgot to put your hands down. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my. <laughs> Normally, right. I wouldn't say anything because I don't want to apply pressure. But in this case, <laughs> okay, okay, I want to introduce to you our friend and our very, very responsible member of the La Mesa City Council, Colin Parent, member of our club, who will administer the oath of office to our newly elected board. Thank you, Colin. And I'm just going to continue leaving everybody on mute here. So you won't hear us repeat the oath, but uh, know that we will. All right. I have to unmute Colin. One moment, please. OK. <laughs> All right, Colin, we, you, are, you are free to unmute yourself, or at least you should be. <laughs> OK. There you go. All right. There we go. Hey. <laughs> we did it. We did it, everybody. Yay. Yay. Te technology, yay. Yeah. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, thank you, Dr. Perkins. Uh, we'll look forward to saying that uh, frequently now. Um, so uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I've served on the, uh, th uh, this board. It was an honor. I know uh, my colleague on the city council, Dr. Weber, served on this board. Uh, so looking forward to seeing uh, some of the new people uh, after they're sworn in uh, joining us on the city council soon. So uh, with that, um, uh, I, I was I have in my script that I'm asking people to unmute, but Mitch, I'm not asking that they're, they're not doing that. Right. Um, I haven't figured out how to do that selectively. So let's just skip that part. Okay. That's fine. Um, so we'll just, uh, and this is a, this is the honor system. And, uh, if you're mouth the words, uh, it, it, it counts. So by, uh, by agreeing to assume the position to which you are elected, uh, you have been, uh, and identified as someone dedicated to the best interests of the La Mesa Foothills Democratic Club and its members. Uh, so now, uh, will each of you please raise your right hand uh, and I will administer the oath of office. Is everybody, okay. Do each of you solemnly promise and pledge that you will administer the position to which you have been elected to the best of your ability and judgment in conformity with the bylaws of the La Mesa Foothills Democratic Club. If you so subscribe, please say, I do. Okay, everyone can lower their hands and congratulations to each of you uh, and best wishes to you uh, for your term of office. We have a, it's an important job. Everyone's got important jobs and, and we definitely need everyone's uh, help and, and continued service. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Oh, Woo. all right, Carol. Is, is that is that is that it? Yes, I believe we, are, we have completed this, and we are in wonderful shape. Thank you, thank you so much. And if any of you know anybody who would be willing to come on as secretary or treasurer or to work on the programming, vice president. Please let those people know, let you know, let people know. We need more people to do this. So let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right, let's move on. Our next speaker is just arrived in the waiting room. So there's a stroke of luck. It's uh, Raul Campillo, newly elected uh, San Diego City Council member. So I'm going to unmute Raul now. And we'll get started. Am I on time, Mitch? You are exactly on time. It was extraordinary. Um, welcome and thank you. All right. Should I spoil the news of what the Senate just voted or no? Please uh, do. Please do. Yes. I think it was like 80. No, it was like 95, 92 senators voted to throw out the 
complaint on Arizona and seven or eight voted yes. So overwhelmingly defeated. And now they got to talk until the house wraps it up. And so, yeah, democracy saved. I'm happy to announce it to <laughs> La Mesa foothills. Uh, yeah. it's, good to, it's good to see everyone. I'm sorry. I was, I didn't realize I was, I was literally coming on right this minute. I thought we we're coming on at like seven 40. I got my jacket here, but I'm still in the office today. Uh, today is the day that the budget priorities memo for the San Diego city council is due. And so my team has been working really hard. We've met with lots of interest groups with uh, community advocates on making sure that the upcoming budget is going to really reflect our new eight to one democratic majority values. Uh, and, and, uh, but also with a lot of potholes being fixed infrastructure, things that are not political at all uh, are obviously in there, but uh, we know we're putting a lot of equity uh, in there. We're going to make sure we're protecting workers, trying to get a cost of living adjustment for our city workers, uh, because we're already so far behind uh, in terms of paying our municipal workers that we can't fall further behind. Otherwise, cities like La Mesa might be able to take them away from us. So uh, anyway, I just uh, wanted to thank you all for inviting me and for supporting me in my election. And we've been in office for about, uh, tw let's see, 26 days at this point. And uh, it's it's really um, it's really exciting time with so many big issues coming up before us. The SDG and E franchise, uh, obviously the extension from last week, so that we can get to June first and come up with a good solution to that issue and make sure SDG and E doesn't run away holding a bag of money that belongs to the taxpayers and the general fund for the city of San Diego. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be appointed as the Economic Development and Intergovernmental Relations Chair uh, for that committee. Uh, we're going to be focusing early on on small business relief, and we're going to be focusing on early on in a sort of long-term plan for structural uh, infrastructure uh, investments that will be provide green jobs, good labor jobs, as well as providing a new base to expand the economy as it comes to biotech, comes to manufacturing, because as we can tell from the pandemic, when your economy is too reliant on tourism, it tends to not be good. Uh, and uh, that's why we have $124 billion projected shortfall for our budget in the city of San Diego. So, uh, you know, diversifying our industry base is going to be really important going into the future. And one way we can do that is by making it easier for uh, companies to be able to ship their products out of San Diego more quickly, whether it's by boat or train or plane, instead of having to send everything to LAX. And, and uh, that takes two, three days off of uh, shipping time. And that's lost money. That's lost customers, right? So uh, thinking about big, broad issues like this. Uh, well, let me stop you right there. How, how do we make it easier? Since that seems to be a good place to jump in to try to make it easier to ship out from San Diego. Well, uh, one thing that we could do is uh, create a better uh, transport across the border for goods that are coming out of Tijuana and Baja California. Uh, if that's a dedicated rail line, which we don't have, that would be really useful. Uh, and I think that given that we have our council together with Mayor Gloria, together with Vice President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, it's, we're gonna be able to hopefully push better immigration and binational ties uh, so that we can create that connection. Uh, and that goes both ways because people, you know, buy things, make things, access, uh, you know, their housing and they access and also healthcare is a big thing that's cross border at this point too. So, uh, you know, we, we got to just work from top to bottom, federal, state, local. Uh, and that means that we got to figure out if we can dedicate some space just to cargo. I think what we're kind of missing, if we can't build a brand new airport that's going to have two runways, we got to figure out how we're going to dedicate something to cargo and dedicate something to travelers so that there isn't an overlap because one of the big problems with San Diego International Airport is that uh, we have planes taking off and landing almost continuously all day long because it's a single runway airport with so many travelers. And that means that we're not able to ship in and ship out things as much as we'd want. It means we also can't bring as many visitors from different locations as we want. And so if we find a place to actually have dedicated cargo uh, aviation, we can actually improve both parts of the economy with manufacturing and with tourism. Uh, so, Google okay. Um, so I can't resist a joke here as, as a former frequent business traveler in the before times, I, I, I know the joke that San Diego airport has one, one, one ring and two parking spaces. So, um, and anyway, we're going to have a connected rail line. Cause we have, I've, 
one of the things I've been doing for the first month is literally setting aside 30 minutes to an hour with every single agency. Like, you know, I, I know that Democrats govern better than Republicans, but the Republicans have a point. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, so I've been meeting with so many different experts on, on all these issues. And I, I think that the new improvements to the airport are going to, they're going to connect, uh, you know, a, a public transit line with, uh, to the airport, which is going to be really important um, and uh, expanding the terminal and, just making it and just making it a better airport and easier to traverse. Um, let's talk about. Okay, so uh, let's we'll hold, hold, hold there for one second. Um, first of all, I want to mention to the members, uh, the people on, on the meeting, please uh, type your questions uh, for Mr. Campillo in chat. Um, we're, we this is, a, this is a participatory sport. It's not a spectator sport. Um, I do want to ask you what um, the county's plans are, or county. I'm sorry, the city's plans are in the immediate term for for, for COVID mitigation. Sorry, repeat that. I, I kind of lost you for two seconds. Uh, just uh, the, the, the immediate plans uh, for the current COVID crisis. What, 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 what do you see the city doing at this point? So I think the first thing we have to do is pass the uh, eviction moratorium out further so that people aren't losing their houses or losing their homes at, as we are experiencing this enormous spike in COVID. Uh, that's, that's upon the council to really take up. Uh, I'd say the other thing is, uh, I mean, I, I was encouraged that Mayor Gloria put out a, a stronger sentiment of enforcement, uh, given that we have no hospital beds uh, available for people. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's the same in the San Diego region, but I remember reading out of LA that if a person has a heart attack, uh, they're not taking them in, right? Uh, and if a person has a blunt trauma from a car, they're just, and the person is, is dying, they can't transport them, right? And so it's like, if they're not resuscitated on the spot, it's like, we don't even take them to the hospital. It's like, it, this is exactly the nightmare scenario that public health experts were telling us for eight months. And here we are, um, because people didn't want to listen to just wearing a mask and, and staying at home when they, when they can. Uh, and so uh, I think the other thing too is, um, you know, we just got a new board of, uh, Board of Supervisors in there. And so we're going to have to collaborate with them on how we can better distribute the vaccine. The federal government obviously doesn't have a plan. I, I'm really just looking at the clock for 14 days so that we can say, okay, do we have any plans now? Uh, and after last night, I'm saying municipal funds uh, might be back on the you know program with a Senate that will actually listen to it now that Mitch McConnell is going to be the minority leader. God, that's great. And so uh, that I think that we're going to be able to hopefully see some sort of extra federal assistance to help us in preventing COVID. Uh, and that's, that's a big start. I think the last thing I'd say about that, um, I'm not sure what degree, I mean, the city does not have uh, health experts or clinicians to help distribute vaccine at this point. And so for me, I say we got to empower nonprofits that do have clinicians, uh, provide them with the space, provide them with the outreach, with the public education campaign that we can do as a city uh, because we don't have the employees who can actually distribute that uh, those services, but it's a lot about partnership. Great, great. So we do have a question from uh, from our, our membership here. Uh, what can we do about the Ash Street building? Uh, well, we're, we have um, some closed session uh, documents that we're still reviewing. One of the first things I got was a 200 plus page report on all, the entire investigation into that. And you can imagine I'm not even done reading that. Um, there's a couple legal options. Uh, we've stopped making payments to the, to the company that, uh, or to the, to the company we, you know, uh, lease to buy or lease to own, uh, the building from, uh, but we're not just, we're, we're actually setting that money aside in case we do have to pay it, but we're not giving it to that company yet, uh, at Sestera, right? And so, um, we, uh, we, there's a couple options. We could just gut the building completely and rebuild it on the inside. I mean, here's a real sad point. That building, if it were operating right now, would be the best building in the city of San Diego's office arsenal of buildings. How sad wow. is that, right? Um, so uh, the, what, are, what are our options? They're all bad and they all cost a lot of money. And some of them are part of this report that I can't talk about because it's in closed session still. So um, you know, I just, uh, I gotta be respectful of the law on that, but what we can do is continue to investigate why Sistera, Manchester, and all these groups were 
hide the ball on us and figure out if the sale was even legal in the first place. Great. So you had uh, some other things you wanted to bring up as priorities. So I'll, I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm on four committees. I already talked about economic development where I'm the chair. Uh, I'm also on the um, public safety and livable neighborhoods committee. I'm vice chair under Monica Montgomery step. And we just turned in our priority memo uh, or priorities memo to her office today. We had a lot of memos going around this first week and uh, emphasizing fully funding of the independent police practices commission. Uh, that looks like it might be somewhere in the range from 1.3 to $1.7 million so that we can uh, really get it ramped up quickly. Uh, we still have to put together how we're gonna compose the commission after the current CRB, which our esteemed Doug uh, Case sits on, uh, transitions over and then we select a whole new group of people eventually. Uh, and so that, that's gonna be complicated, but the fully funding of it right at the beginning is important. Uh, the livable neighborhoods aspect of that is also really important in terms of making sure our side, our cracked sidewalks are repaired and that uh, we're, we're emphasizing, you know, we're taking care of our bike lanes. We're taking care of our, of our street signs that have been blown over or missing and, and things like that. Um, and also just dedicating a lot more money to places in district four and district eight that don't even have roads. That was one of the, that was one of the things I learned on the campaign, but then saw it even more so after being elected and seeing a report on the uh, quality of the streets throughout the city. Uh, it's hard. It's, it's hard to believe that it's like you're in the city of San Diego and this is, it's not, it's just a gravel street. And this is a street that has homes on it. It's like, you're telling me we don't have asphalt for this road. So we really got to dedicate a lot more resources there. And I, and I really thank the people from the um, community budget Alliance who sat down with us for over two hours and mapped out a whole bunch of priorities uh, that, uh, you know, people that for me in district seven don't necessarily know so that we could advocate for that. But that also includes things like uh, infrastructure, um, park safety, electrification in, in Linda Vista as well. So uh, livable neighborhoods, public safety aspect is really important. And then, uh, you know, relevant to La Mesa Foothills is I'm going to be the chair of the Mission Trails Regional Task Force and hmm. on the San Diego River Conservancy. And I really want to work both of those committees together. Uh, one has a lot more funding than the other. Uh, the Mission Trails uh, Task Force really gets a lot of its money because of the antennas on the top of the mountain that, uh, that uh, they pay us as the city to have there. Um, and then for the regional, uh, for the Water Conservancy Board, we have access to a lot of water bond money through the former bill SB1 that allows us to do flood mitigation, environmental protection, uh, and other infrastructure projects that actually improve the environment, the cleanliness of the water in the river. And so uh, that, that firm, from an environmental perspective, that's really important to me. I'm excited. I've, I've been to many of those meetings before the pandemic hit. And uh, it's really a lot of experts, scientists, parks and rec people who uh, dole out a lot of money to a lot of projects all the way from uh, I've, past Santee, up, I think the river starts up in Ramona. So all the way from Ramona down to uh, the beach, um, Mission Beach is where that, the, the scope of that committee looks at uh, in terms of funding uh, environmental protection and infrastructure. Okay, good. Um, so uh, we have another question in chat. Uh, is there anything that uh, the city can do uh, or should be doing to address homelessness? Absolutely. So, uh, pro you know, project there's Project Home Key and there's Project Turnkey. And I'm pretty sure that Project Home Key uh, is the one with state funding to be able to buy up older ho uh, hotels and make them into permanent supportive housing units. We just did this uh, in, it was in September in District 7. It was on uh, Hotel Circle South. And so there's about 190 units of permanent supportive housing that are going to be transformed so that residents can be there and have the services come to them. In terms of the... Uh, you know, I, I just had a meeting today with the Housing Federation and how we want to approach, uh, you know, another attempt at a bond measure that might be able to be used for affordable housing. We're going to have to address inclusionary fees. We're going to have to address in lieu fees. Um, you know, I'm not on the land use and housing uh, committee, but in our budget priorities memo, which was about 24 pages long, longer than normal. I'm sorry for the people who have to read that, but uh, we spent a lot of time on it. Homelessness is a big aspect of that. And it's really a housing first policy mentality that my office is bringing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to be discussing, uh, you know, potential repeal of uh, the vehicle habitation ordinance, uh, so the feasibility of that, 
uh, there's there's lots of things that we want to look at and see if we, see if they're doable. Um, what is the last thing I'd say about housing and homelessness? Um, you know, and we know that it's uh, it's not just the city of San Diego that faces this problem. And one of the things I hear from people in District Seven a lot is if if we if we provide the resources, homeless people come here, and then it's our problem. And I always have to say to myself, well, let's not. I, I understand that idea. Uh, but from a humanitarian point of view, we, we should provide assistance to the people who are suffering the most and usually through no fault of their own. But it's also our job as elected officials of the city of San Diego to make sure the county is doing what it should be doing and what other municipalities are doing. We have to approach this uh, collaboratively, co collaboratively across jurisdictions so that other municipalities are doing their work. And uh, so that's, that's uh, the approach I'm bringing to it. And uh, I'm seeing more questions come up, but homelessness is a big priority of ours. Uh, it's just not the committee that I'm on. So it's, uh, it, it's in the budget priorities memo for sure, though. And it's also addressed to in livable neighborhoods um, uh, aspect of the public safety and livable neighborhoods uh, platform. Um, we'll see to what degree the council sends some policies to us and sends some to land use and housing. But there's a lot of overlap in our committees. Yeah. Um... Related issue to homelessness is just the issue of trying to make housing in San Diego more affordable. Is there anything that you guys are looking at for that? So what I'm, I'll, I'll pause and I'll wait because I know that the uh, the state Senate has rolled out a, uh, a package of six bills that I've already started pouring through uh, to, to address issues of, you know, density bonus so that uh, developers are more incentivized to build, but at the same time, uh, they're also looking at possibly putting a bond on the uh, state state ballot in an upcoming election. Um, there's lots of aspects going on there and trying to see how that's going to impact District 7. Um, but generally speaking, I'm looking at those and I'm supportive of what I see. Uh, you know, we should, we should get Doug on here and I'm sure, I don't know if he brought it up earlier or if he's spoken yet, but um, ask him that question. Uh, sorry, Doug. Uh, and then the, um, the, the other aspect of it too is that... Um, we can't just have housing without the infrastructure to go along with it. And I know that that's what a lot of people who, who live around Grantville uh, talk a lot about on the campaign trail. In Allied Gardens and in Del Cerro and in San Carlos, anybody who essentially uses Mission Gorge or Friars Road coming east to west knows that by not improving the streets and, not, and by not improving the bus routes and by not uh, you know, uh, making sure that just the traffic layout was better planned, that the development in Grantville was important to get veteran permanent supportive housing and, and low income housing in there, but it's a, it's a traffic nightmare, right? So uh, some people use Friars Road to go all the way from, you know, Santee, you know, you take Mission Gorge and then keep right on Friars all the way to the five instead of taking the freeway. So uh, I, before we get into the details of how to get housing more affordable, we also have to invest in the infrastructure. So those go hand in hand, um, but you, uh, I, I don't want, I want people who live in District 7 to know that I care about making sure that we have the infrastructure first before we add more housing on that east side of the district. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're gonna wrap up momentarily. Um, do you have any anything uh, final that you'd like to say at this point? Uh, so I'm, I'm just looking very quickly. I, I appreciate the support of, of the club and, and all your members. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing issues of uh, old downtown library not not sure what the plan is on that, but that rings a bell that the San Carlos Library and getting it renovated after 30 years of promises is in my budget priority memo. It's on there, it's clear, it's nice and loud, and I've told a lot of people about it. So I'm gonna really push hard for that. Um, and so uh, I just want you to know that I'm gonna, coming from my committee, and what I'm really gonna be pushing hard for is bringing really good jobs, union jobs, green jobs to San Diego, uh, right now, we, we, we see how drastically the economy has affected people. And if we, had a, we, if we had a stabler economy, we wouldn't be in such dire straits. And for the people in the restaurant industry and the service industries who've been laid off, um, we, we've seen that they have not bounced back in the same way a lot of, of the higher wage industries have come back in the past you know, five, six months uh, you know, after June, July. Um, we got to protect them in, with rental assistance. And uh, we're not going to turn a blind eye to that. That, that, that issue. And, and thankfully, it looks like we have about $80 million coming to the city of San Diego from the federal act that was signed just after Christmas. 
And so we're going to have to responsibly put that out for people who are suffering the most, but um, that's just the way I'm approaching the job. And, you know, you can count on me to be here late. I always, uh, you know, I'll just say this for all the people who voted for me here. Thank you so much. I love this job. I am so honored to be here and I leave every day so excited to just come back the next day and work. It, it really is an honor to be a public servant and uh, you know, I'm learning a lot. I'm gonna learn quick. If you have any questions, please reach out and just say you're from the Mesa Foothills Club and you'll get a call back from me. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Have a good, Thank uh, you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll right. stick on and listen on for a little while. Great. I'm going to mute Raul. I learned the hard way that people will accidentally already muted himself. Good job, Raul. All right. So now we're going to turn to Nathan Fletcher and uh, put Mr. Fletcher on the spot. Here we are. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mitch. How, how are the Mesa Democrats doing tonight? You all are outstanding. Love and appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, Raul, uh, I knew you're gonna be dynamic, brother. You're gonna do great. Uh, I got a couple of things to call you about in your district, some things we can work on. I, I think there's some way, ways I can help you a little bit. So I wanna congratulate uh, Raul for his election. Uh, you know, we have, I gotta tell you, you know, the federal race was, was a little bit mixed. I mean, we won, we won, we won the, the White House. We won the Senate and, and we have to take comfort uh, in all of that. And I think today was certainly one of the darkest reminders of, of the depth uh, that this president has driven our country to. You know, as a, as a Marine uh, who served in combat zones, I actually trained to evacuate embassies under siege and have dealt with situations like that. And that's the type of thing that, you know, Marines are okay to train to encounter. That's not the type of thing we ever want to see in our, our streets and to, you know, come home after a long day and have to explain to your kids, uh, you know, who saw little clips of it here and there, what happened, uh, really should motivate all of us to, uh, it's not about defeating Trump, it is about defeating Trumpism uh, and everything that he represents and everything that he stands for. And, and it should really, really motivate all of us as we move forward. But, you know, here locally, uh, look, we had an incredible election. I will tell you, you all will remember, I came out to you uh, 2016, uh, I came out and I said, hey, I'm telling you, we can change the county. It is 5-0 Republican. And I said, we're going to break through uh, that red wall. And, and man, we had to fight. It was millions. So many of you, you came in and you, I remember so many, so many of you saying, hey, we're going to adopt you. You're going to be our supervisor. And you came into D4 and you walked and we raised money and we fought through and we won. And, and we got more done than I thought we would get done. Almost 70 actions done. Biggest investment ever in behavioral health, real action uh, on racial justice, expanding citizens, law enforcement review board, office of equity, human relations commission, changing the tide uh, on climate change. We, we took action to welcome our LGBTQ community. We flew the pride flag. I mean, time and again, we got in these fights and we made progress, but it wasn't enough. And in 2016, I remember saying, hey, that's one, right? We're going to get to one. And then we're going to come back in 2020. And we're going to get two and then we're going to get three. And I'm not the smartest kid, but when you got a body of five, you got to get the three. And we did it. We did it. And we have the Democratic majority on the largest governing body in San Diego County. And all of you are a part of it. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, and, and to everyone who worked decades who said, hey, we're going to change the board. It's going to happen one day. And people say, oh, that's crazy. We now have a Democratic majority and a Democratic chair at the Board of Supervisors. And when I got sworn in as chair, I said, you know what, for decades, it's a conservative body because conservative politicians got elected by the voters and they govern consistent with their values. And times have changed. And now progressive supervisors got elected and rest assured, we will govern consistent with our values as well. Uh, and, and that is what we are going to do. Uh, coming up on Tuesday, uh, we've laid out what we call our framework for the future. Uh, and this is changing a lot of the way that the county operates. Uh, we've docketed with, with Supervisor Nora Vargas uh, a declaring racism as a public health crisis. We ought to be honest. We have never reconciled the original sin at the founding of our country. 
And it was intentional government policies that have perpetuated systemic racism in our society today. And that's true whether you're talking about environmental justice. Why do kids in Barrio Logan uh, have eight times the asthma rate as kids in La Jolla? Because they are poor brown children. It is true with land use and zoning and redlining. It is true with economic justice issues. It is true uh, across the board. And we need to acknowledge it. But more than just acknowledge it, we need to put in place what we are going to do to begin to change it. And we're changing the structure of county government. We're empowering the Office of Equity and Racial Justice we created last year. We're empowering the Human Relations Commission. We're adding the way we make policy at the county. Did you write what's called a board letter? It's kind of a legislative action. And there's a section, what's the fiscal impact? There will now be a section, what is the racial equity impact? To make us think intentionally about everything we do. Is this, is this, is, is this addressing these issues? Uh, we are changing our data collection. You know, we had a presentation recently on our Live Well program and they touted a success because they said this chronic disease went down this much in San Diego County. I said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Break that number out. Because if that chronic disease went down 5% amongst people who are privileged and have access to health care, but it went up 3% amongst other folks, that's not a net positive step forward at 2% because that's not addressing equity versus equality. Uh, now, you know, I know you all know this supervisor, Jim Desmond, apparently does not. Uh, he was complaining that our board appointments, he said that they they weren't fair because he didn't get as many appointments as Nora Vargas and Tara Lawson Reamer. And I said, well, I thought Republicans were opposed to participation trophies. Uh, I, 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 I thought, I thought, I thought y'all, I thought y'all weren't down. You didn't think everyone gets a trophy just for showing up. You got to win. And, and we won. But the second thing he doesn't understand is it is the difference between equity and equality. And so I had to correct him and say, you know, you're saying that the committee distributions are not equitable. When in reality, what you mean is they're not equal. And they are not equal, Jim Desmond. You get appointed to seven committees and commissions. Nora Vargas gets appointed to 21. Because for 40 years, people like Jim Desmond have occupied all of these seats. And other communities have never had a seat. And if we're going to address equity, we're going to overinvest in certain communities until we get to a point. And I dream of the day when we can talk about equality and not equity. Uh, but we're bringing that one forward. We're bringing forward one declaring climate change is real. The days of us denying climate change, the days of us wasting our time debating land use things about blowing the top off of mountains in the back country and high fire prone areas where you can't get insurance and you can't get there other than a car. Those days are over. Uh, We're going to move forward with building housing where it's appropriate, where it ought to be. Uh, along transit corridors in a way that recognizes what we do. We're going to open up our county government, be more transparent and more open uh, with data, with access, with information, engaging the public, bringing people in. We're an almost $7 billion a year entity, so we will be docketing that as well. Uh, we are uh, bringing forward another one on fiscal policies. It's not as exciting, but we can't make the structural changes we need until we really dig in and address uh, 40 years of rules and budgetary procedures and county policies that prohibit us from making the investments that we need to make in the right way. Tara Lawson Reamer and I are gonna do that one uh, together. Uh, we're gonna wipe out on Tuesday, the whole ledge plan. So the county, you know, we do a lot of interacting with other government agencies and entities. And for 40 years, they've been, maybe not 40 years, certainly for, for well, as long as Gavin Newsom's been there and probably as long as Jerry Brown's been there. They have been dead set against everything the state of California does. They got a 117 page ledge plan. It includes stuff about making it harder to vote, saying that people who, who have made a mistake and committed a crime, we're going to stop them from getting help and assistance when they get out. Uh, just truly offensive stuff, opposing any changes to use of force policies. And I started reading through this thing and there's 117 pages and I got about five pages in. I said, oh, the hell with it. We're going to delete the whole thing. I'm not even reading any more of this nonsense. We're just going to wipe the whole thing out. We're going to adopt a statement of values and give direction to our staff on what we do. And we're gonna recognize the state of California as our ally and our partner. The same is true with the city of San Diego. The county and the city have been button heads for a long time. And you know what? We are tied by geography and we are tied by purpose. And we're gonna align, we got a mayor, we got an incredible council, folks like Raul, and we're gonna move forward uh, and we're gonna tackle uh, and address those issues. And then the last one, and this is just Tuesday, we're gonna have more coming. This is just what we're gonna do on Tuesday. Uh, and then the last one we're gonna do on Tuesday uh, relates to COVID-19. 
And I just want to talk for a minute about what we're facing around COVID. Uh, I think Tina is on. Tina, my heart hurts for your whole family right now. Uh, and and I want you to know uh, every day that we've been in this pandemic, I've gone out there and fought as best I could uh, to be on the side of data, to be on the side of science, to understand that, that, that a life has value and, and that the folks, whether you have an underlying health condition uh, or you're a senior citizen or you're a frontline Latino service worker uh, in the throes of what you're facing, we have to fight for you. And, and we've had some struggles. You know, I think there's a lot of things that we've done well as it relates to this, but frankly, we've had a board that has been all over the map. And I've been on the losing end of a series of 4-1 votes where I'm fighting to protect public health. And it's not even just about public health. I care about fighting to keep people safe. But if your focus is keeping our businesses and jobs open, you do the same thing. You do the same thing. That's the irony of the whole COVID debate. There's issues. Look, we're Democrats. We're proud progressives. We ideologically disagree with Republicans on a lot of issues. COVID was a time we just needed to work the problem. Because whether you want to keep business open or save lives, you wear the mask, you physically distance, you avoid high risk indoor settings. This is not some conspiracy cooked up to take away people's liberty. This is a global pandemic that requires us to dig deep and to be honest and be factual and be true. And so we're documenting a letter. We are wiping out the seven previous actions that were irresponsible and reckless. We are making clear we trust data, we trust science, and we are going to fight our way to get out of this. And the other piece of that is recognizing that COVID does not have an equal impact on every community out there. Uh, and our funding and our response also should not be equal. Our Latino community is 30% of San Diego. They are 65% of COVID cases, 65% of COVID cases, and they are under tested. So that means that we have to address that. And as we come out of this crisis, COVID has shined a light on the inequities in our society, and we have to embrace, build back better, and it has to mean something significant, uh, starting with the broken nature of our healthcare system. It ought to be a fundamental right available to everyone, regardless of income, uh, country of birth, immigration status, uh, or geography, uh, and a whole host of other things. So that's what we're going to do on Tuesday. And then I'll come back and share with you what we got planned for the weeks ahead. But uh, I, I, am, uh, I am excited about where we're going in county government. I'm excited about the opportunities with the county, the city, the state. You know, we, we got some state leaders. Uh, we got the president of the Senate as a San Diegan. We got this other woman who is uh, quite a uh, quite a character uh, and uh, who's our chair of the Appropriations Committee. And uh, and and I'm very fond of this this woman. Uh, she's a San Diegan. Uh, I happen to live with her. My wife. Uh, we have an incredible moment. We got a Californian in the White House. Uh, we got a new U.S. Senator. My buddy Javier Becerra is going to be Health and Human Services Secretary. Uh, I really think we are poised to make some really significant issues around mental health, okay. and drug treatment, tackling homeless. Right. We're going to I'm do gonna, things. I'm going to give you an opportunity to take a breath here, um, All right. and but only one short breath because I'm just going to ask for questions. Uh, remind the, the the members that they could put questions in chat, um, and. Uh, Please do. We'll jump in. We'll address them. You're on a roll, so I'm going to mute myself. Keep going. Go no, 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 I'm good. Let's go through the questions. All right, let's do some questions here. Um, so um, I got a couple right here um, that I wrote down. Uh, first of all, a question out of ignorance here. Does the county have any responsibility for inoculations, or is that something that's handled on another yeah. level entirely? Okay, so I'm going to give you the short version of this one, because uh, as you just saw, I can get wound up and go for a long time. The, look, the vaccine, the vaccine distribution system is not ideal uh, the way it's set up. And the reason is because we have a fragmented, disjointed, for-profit healthcare system. That is, the, that is the nature of our healthcare system. That's why part of the response to COVID has been so awful. So the way it's going now is, is health systems uh, are being sent vaccines themselves. Sharp gets them, Scripps gets them, Kaiser gets them. Don't get me started on Kaiser. Uh, UC San Diego gets them. Uh, Someone at the federal level decided, well, we're going to send CVS all the vaccines to do the skilled nursing facilities, the long-term care facilities. So no one can explain to me how the hell CVS is going to go out to all these places and do the vaccines. But nonetheless, someone in D.C. decided that was a good idea. DOD gets them direct. VA gets them direct. What we're doing at the county is, is trying to play a role of an air traffic controller uh, and try and coordinate all of these disparate entities uh, but I was on the phone with, with Secretary Galley tonight, and I think where we ought to go as a county is let's just invest the money 
let's say, you know, we, we've got 40 testing sites throughout San Diego County. They're free. You can get results in a day and a half on average. Uh, anyone can go get them. Uh, you just sign up. I think that we ought to do something similar around vaccines. Uh, we ought to just set them up. We ought to staff them and then work through the tiered systems. Right now we're in phase 1A. Uh, 1A is essentially healthcare workers. We're doing healthcare workers first. When we get down with healthcare workers, and there's a lot of them. I mean, in San Diego County, we're talking, there, there's a big number. It's going to take a lot of vaccines. Then we will move to, uh, to phase 1B. So we are involved. Uh, we have some. We're kind of safety net, filling some gaps. Uh, we did a wonderful program with the city of San Diego, Raul knows about, where we uh, we went because, you know, we have a shortage of folks to give the vaccines because our doctors and nurses are a little busy at the moment uh, treating the, the mass surge of COVID patients. So we said, hey, let's take the paramedics. Let's train them to be vaccinators. And then we can deploy them as a workforce, just working some overtime. Um, and so we, we're doing a lot of those things. But I think there's an opportunity for us to really step up our role and, uh, and do more. Great. Great. So we have a question uh, from Chris Pearson. Um, institutional staff at the city and county were hired and scared by Republican administrators. So how do you work with them? <laughs> uh, well, Chris, you know, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing about this. This is at least at least my, my, my take on this. The staff that work there work for the Board of Supervisors and and they did things that I didn't like because that's what the board directed them to do. Uh, and now we have a new board. And yesterday I laid out really clear. It's on our YouTube page. I made the chair's address. I said, this is who we are as a county. This is what we're going to do. And I will tell you, it's like magic. Top staff are like, hey, that's great. We're progressive now. Let's do it. Because the majority of the institutional staff, they're, 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 they're public servants. They're, they're, but not, not, not in the way Raul and I or Colin, who I think is on, are public servants. You know, we're, we're political animals. We're driving an agenda. They get up and go to work to provide a service to the public of making the parks nice, cleaning the restrooms, doing those types of things. And so uh, they, they will fall in line with what the board wants. Uh, and if there's an isolated case where they don't, then, then they, they can go serve the public uh, in some other jurisdiction that wants to do it a different way. But I actually don't worry about that. Uh, I think the board changes, board votes, sends clear direction. Uh, they're professionals and they, they will implement that. So what we had to change was the board. We changed the board. Uh, and I think the staff will, will fulfill the vision of the board. Okay, so we have a question here um, from Leslie Fadum. I am a mental health specialist and have heard from many clients and other folks who tell me they're refusing to be vaccinated, including healthcare workers at senior residences. Can you mandate being vaccinated? Well, that's okay. What do I believe or what are we likely to do? And I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Look, I uh, live... Let's, let's I lived in the developing world. I have seen young kids with polio in countries that didn't have access to vaccines. I believe that vaccines are a modern miracle of medicine and they're one of the greatest public health accomplishments of our lifetime. Uh, I believe in the science, I believe in the data uh, and this vaccine, you know, people say, well, I don't want it because it was rushed. You gotta understand the nature of vaccine development. There is a series of steps you have to do but in normal vaccine development, you have to do those steps sequentially. But because there were so many resources, they were able to do those steps simultaneously. But every step was done the same as it always was. This vaccine is safe. Uh, I did a lot of legislation back in the assembly requiring vaccines. I supported the efforts around your kids have to get vaccinated. They can't go to schools. Um, we will see where the state of California goes in terms of the COVID vaccine. I believe that we will get enough for the public to accept the vaccine that we can get to herd immunity. It is going to be education. It is going to be engagement. There are communities that rightfully are skeptical. Uh, African American community, look, there we got a dark history of you know having taken black men and they got syphilis and we're not going to tell them they got syphilis and we got a cure for syphilis, but we're not going to give it to them. We got to address some of that. So we're working with community partners, trusted messengers, and I think as we get there, I think we'll be able to get to herd immunity uh, without requiring it. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll see we'll see how it goes. Okay, we have a question from uh, Jay Steiger. He describes it as a boring in the weeds comment, but I'm a boring in the weeds person, so I welcome <laughs> that. Um, as a member of one of the community planning groups in the county, it would be nice to see the county planning board become more receptive to concerns raised by the community planning groups. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think I think you know when you think about the the county planning group again, that is a reflection of the, the supervisors appoint those folks. And, and so I think what, what you got to do is reach out to our supervisors and tell them the types of folks that you would like appointed to that body. 
Uh, and then if those folks are not receptive and not engaged, not listening to that, then you need to give that 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 back because you know I have wonderful appointees uh, to a whole variety of boards, and and I tell them, hey, you you are free uh, to uh, do your work uh, on this board or commission as long as it's consistent with how I want to do it. And and if not, then we can switch out with someone else. Uh, and so that is a, that is a part of change. I will also tell you, my appointees to boards and commissions, like ninety something percent of them, have never been appointed to a county thing ever. Because you can't just keep cycling the same. Change has to actually mean something. I think change has to come there as well. Okay, great. So I'm going to open the floor up to one more question for Mr. Fletcher. And then while we're waiting for that, is there anything you'd like to add, sir? I just want to give a shout out to one of your own, Colin Parrott. Uh, I don't know if Colin's on. I know he normally is. He, he might have had something to go to. Look, you know, Raul was talking about homelessness and how hard it is and challenging it is. And you know, maybe a little controversial with some of y'all, but we had an opportunity in La Mesa to step up. We had $36 million that was not your money. It was state money. So it's a little bit your money and some county money and some other money, but $36 million, property ready to go, turnkey security. We could have ended homelessness in La Mesa. Uh, and he was the only one to step forward and say, this is the right thing to do. It's a difficult decision. Uh, I know some folks will be opposed to it because, you know, there, there's no way when you talk about solving homelessness, it's like people saying, hey, there's a leak in your side of the boat. It's always it's got to go somewhere and not my problem. But, hey, we're all in this boat together, you know, and I take the projects in the heart of my district. and I go out and defend them. And I, I want to give Colin a shout out for having the courage to be willing to take it. Ultimately, it didn't get through. Uh, but I, I, I appreciate the position he took and, and the way he was willing to lean into that. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think that does it for this evening. All right. And have have a great night. And we're thank you all, La Mesa. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Our next speaker, I think my colleague, uh, Dr. Linda Armacost, had some things she wanted to say. Linda, you're unmuted. Take it away. Oh well. Um... Okay, what I was going to talk about seems, uh, well, it's still relevant, uh, but um, given today's activities, it's kind of hard to get reoriented. So um, I would like to, I know we have to get rid of the pandemic. We have so many things to do, and now we have uh, control of the Senate. You know, we have a chance to really, really make some progress. And I'm very excited that Dr. Jill Biden is our first lady because my main thing and always has been, and I know many of you, is education. And so I'd like to address this year, really, the state of public education in this country, which is a disgrace, I'm sorry. We have wonderful educators, we have people busting their butts to do the right thing, but it's not a priority. And for the last, 30 years, we have witnessed benign, benign neglect of our public educational systems. And the chickens have come home to roost. Um, we have a senator from Alabama who cannot name the three branches of government, okay? 25% of the people think that the sun goes around the earth. We have seen a conscious dumbing down underfunding and non-prioritization of public education in this country. And it's a disgrace. Um, they say education is the great equalizer. Here it's the great unequalizer because of the funding and the focus. Um, it's, it, I don't even know where to start. First of all, I'm excited, as I said, because we have uh, an educator in the White House, and we're gonna get rid of that rapacious strumpet uh, who was our uh, Secretary of Education. You know, she was a, re a Republican tool, never set foot in a public school, and did her damnness to take away what little structure we had left. So several things, one, like I said, is the funding structure. And I'm reminded, did anyone here ever see the movie, The Breakfast Club? back in the day, remember? I think it should be required viewing for anyone who gets near or in a high school. But if the point is, if you remember the setting, the high school was beautiful, right? 
They had this huge atrium. Remember the library? This high school was fine. It was nice. Well, that high school was near where I lived. And if you got in your car and you went 10 minutes, you would find a school not like that. You would find a school with portable trailers. The school building had leaks in the ceiling. <clears throat> they had outdoor porta potties. They could not afford up to date textbooks. It's appalling within 10 minutes. And that's because of the funding. So when you depend, when we have depended for years on local tax bases to uh, fund education, we get this horrible mishmash. Uh, other countries understand what greater investment can we make in our future than our children? I mean, that's it. Other countries understand that from uh, wonderful paid preschool, day school, early education, free education, because they understand who's going to be uh, controlling our future. And now we have, uh, well, look what happened today. Look what happened today. These people have no freaking idea what, how the government works, what the government does, because we have systematically, like I said, withdrawn critical thinking skills, governmental education. Um, it's, it's appalling. So that's my, that's my big thing this year is after we get through the pandemic and everything, we have to focus on education. Other countries have done that. They pay their educators equivalent to other professionals, doctors, attorneys, architects. And you will only get the best and the brightest if you have that kind of uh, commitment to pay for the best and the brightest. Educators are working really hard with very few resources, but they're also not being equipped educationally as they should be. And so it, it covers many different areas. And I just have a couple of um, examples or fun things that I learned while I was running for the school board, I was president of a citizens advisory council, kind of a working bee uh, committee for our local school board. And the first was early education and the importance of early, early education. There is a, um, an endeavor in Milwaukee called Operation Baby Snatch. And if we all know more about Milwaukee now because of this election and Milwaukee is very diverse, they have a lot of poverty. So the plan was they actually snatched babies and took them to a place and they gave them uh, enrichment and interactive and wonderful daycare and preschool experiences. And then they tracked those babies all the way through until fifth grade. And they had not only excelled, they had increased their IQ by seven points. That's huge, that's huge. That can be done. That can be done. We can have, take children in depressing and, and just horrible situations and actually um, create wonderful, I don't know. I don't even know what to say. The other one that I thought was cool happened in California, and this has to do with educators. And it was um, an elementary school. In the beginning of the year, the principal called in a group of teachers, and he said, based on your... Uh, previous work experience, we understand you are the best teachers in this school. And so as a reward, this year you will each get a class of the best and brightest students in this school. And we expect wonderful things from you. Okay, school year goes by, end of the year, principal calls them in. He said, oh my gosh, I was right. Every one of you, your classes excelled you broke the envelope. You were top of the top of the top. And the teacher said, well, that's because we're the best, right? And he said, well, I have to tell you, we threw all the teacher's name in a hat and we pulled them out at random. And you were chosen. Oh, but, but we had the best students, right? We had the very best and the brightest and that's why it worked. He goes, well, the other thing I have to tell you is we put all the students' name in a hat and we drew them all at random. 
So what's the lesson there? What is the lesson there? All kids have talent. All kids can excel. All kids can learn, right? But we don't view it that way. You get typed and like I said, if it's not right in second grade, it's not gonna be right anywhere. So we have several, um, there are things I wanted to address going forward. One is the funding, the absolutely unequal, racist, horrible funding of our schools. And the other is educators, educating them, giving them the resources, you know, helping them to excel and then to go from there. So I'm probably babbling on because I had two glasses of wine and it's been a really rough day, but um, um, it just, it's just so important. I can't think thank of you. anything else. So thank you, Mitch, for letting me Thank go you, on. Linda. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Always, always welcome. And uh, if, if you're calling out great high school movies, don't forget Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Based oh my on, God, yes. <laughs> based, based, on, based on Claremont Mesa High School right here. So oh, I didn't know. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so um, I think next up, um, also, we're going to hear from another board member. Um, Evelyn Andrade, you have uh, some new uh, a new day job, and you've agreed to talk to us about it for uh, a minute or two. So I've unmuted you. Evelyn, you're up. Hi, everyone. Evelyn Andrade. Um, yes, I am a new policy advisor to Tara Lawson Reamer, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, so you all know what I'm going to be responsible for. So I will be working on land use, environment, anything that's environmental justice, climate justice. I'm going to be working on the climate action plan, equity, um, protecting our coastlines, open spaces, regional sustainability, uh, water and air pollution, as well as our transportation infrastructure. Um, so please, please reach out if you have any questions or need uh, any kind of support. If I cannot help you, I will definitely direct you to the person who can. Um, I'm gonna put my new phone number and email uh, in the chat so you all can reach out to me. Know that I am a resource and uh, I'm really excited to, to be on the team. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, and uh, now I um, do want to remind everybody on the meeting um, to renew, pay your dues, and join the club if you have not done so anyway. Uh, your donations help us advance progressive candidates and causes throughout the county. And there is instructions, which my colleague uh, Katie Sagetti put in the text chat. So look for that there. Um, and that's very important, so please do do that. Um, and now we're gonna move on to the time when we make time for local leaders to talk about the things that are important to them. So if anybody wants to address the club, please either, um, ideally, if, if you can, please uh, type into text chat, but I know that one or two people who like to talk to us um, have difficulty with that. So you can also raise your hand and we'll keep an eye on that. And I'm gonna start up at the top of the alphabet with uh, Doug Case. So I'm unmuting you now. I seem to have unmuted the wrong person. Doug, are you there? No, I didn't unmute you right. All right, there you go, that should work. Here we go. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I'm Doug Case. I am the political affairs director for a Senate president. Uh, Pro tem uh, Tony Atkins. Uh, the legislature goes back into session uh, next week. Uh, we got delayed a week because of uh, COVID, and uh, they have, will have a, an awful lot on their plate. Uh, Raul already mentioned the housing production bills, and I put a link about that in the chat. A major thing they're going to be focusing on is the budget. Uh, the governor will release his proposed budget this coming Friday. They'll be dealing with a lot of issues regarding. Um, uh, <clears throat> issues related to COVID, including uh, support for small businesses, uh, eviction moratorium, et cetera. Um, also, we'll continue to deal with the issues regarding uh, uh, criminal justice issues and, uh, and police reform, um, and as well as issues related to emergency preparedness and uh, wildfire prevention. Um, so all those are significant issues. And I look forward to coming back on a monthly basis and giving an update of what the, the legislature Nature is done. So thank you. Thank you, Doug. Always, always welcome to come and talk to the board uh, or to the membership, rather. Um, all right, let's take a look and see if we got any other people who want to 
speak to the club. I don't see anything in chat. I'm going to do a quick scan of the member window. The audience window. I do not see any raised hands, so I guess that does it for this evening. Um, and I guess we'll uh, we'll zip it up. Thanks for staying with us, and we hope to see you soon in real life. Join us for our next meeting, Wednesday, February 3rd, same time, 7 p.m. for the meeting itself, 6.30 p.m. for unstructured social conversation. You can look for a replay of this meeting on our YouTube channel. Just search for La Mesa Foothills Democratic Club on YouTube and subscribe while you're there. Also, look for links to the video on our website, Facebook page, and Twitter account, and in our email update. We'll get that going pretty soon. Um, the website is La Mesa Foothills Democratic Club.com, or if that's too much for you to type, just lmfdems.com will get you there. Uh, if you want to sign up for our email updates, go to that website and look for the Get Email Updates link at the top of the page. By the way, I'm aware that we seem to be getting a number of reports of people not getting email. I don't know if that's just bad luck for some of us or if there's something going on. So I'm going to get out the monkey wrench and overalls over the weekend and see if I can get that sorted out. Um, thanks to the board for their hard work in arranging this meeting. And thanks to our guests who came and spoke and to you for spending some of your valuable time with us. Good night, everybody. Stay healthy, stay sane, and we will see you again soon.